Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining our webinar this evening. Um, I am Crystal Cargis, and we're just thankful to have you here with us on behalf of Addiction Hope. And this webinar is in conjunction with Timberline Knowles Residential Treatment Center. Tonight, our webinar presentation is on self-injury treatment through the lens of the disease model of addiction and DBT. Featuring our guest speakers tonight, Megan Tomasek and Leela Saffel. And just a couple quick things um, to go through before we get started on our presentation for this evening. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our presenters today by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And your attendance in this webinar for this evening will award you one CE credit. And we will be uploading our program evaluation form for you to download and complete and submit in order to receive your CE credit. So I would now like to transition this over to Megan and Leela, who will be our presenters for this evening. Thank you, Crystal. Hi, I'm Megan Tomasek. And I'm Leela Sackle. And we're here, as Crystal, Crystal shared with you, um, from Timberline Knowles. It's a residential treatment in Lamont, Illinois, right outside of Chicago, where we treat women and teenagers, teenage girls um, with for eating disorders, trauma, substance, mood, co-occurring, um, all different types of treatment. So um, our role there is we're a DBT specialist, so we're both DBT therapists, and we're here to discuss self-injury as it is an addiction and also offer you guys some DBT tools and insight. Throughout our time today, you might hear us say TK, and by that we mean Timberline Knowles. So if we slip into our TK jargon, we apologize, we do mean Timberline Knowles. So let's transition into talking about our goals for today. So first off, we're going to work on understanding self-injury. Oh, there we go. Um, we're going to define it, and then we're going to talk about some facts and myths around self-injury, and then talk about the functions, so why people self-injure. And that's going to transition us into discussing process addictions. You'll find that we um, and research is supporting that a self-injury is a process addiction. So we're going to talk about what that looks like. And then we're going to give a general overview of DBT and give you some specific skills that we find to be really helpful in treating our clients who engage in self-injury. All right, so what is self-injury? Megan, can you define it for us? Okay, so you can see this definition that we provided up on your screen. And um, we felt drawn to this definition for a few reasons. I really appreciated how it specified that it's an intentional act and also that it's not um, a part of like a cultural norm, something that's sanctioned within society. So it's a, a choice of a way for someone to inflict injury on their body. And we want to get a little bit into the specifics about kind of some common misconceptions with a little bit interactive piece with you all to do some true and false with you about self-injury. So our first uh, statement that we would like you to tell us if it's true or false is self-injury is a suicide attempt. So um, hopefully you'll be seeing that on your screen and you'll be able to answer true or false. Self-injury is a suicide attempt. I'll give you just a minute to answer that. Just a couple more seconds for people to answer that question. Self-injury is a suicide attempt. We were hoping for this part for the, be the interactive piece. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are getting this true and false um, screen. Um, okay, we'll just answer it. So, 
self-injury is not a suicide attempt, actually. So um, one of the terms that we use to describe self-injury is called parasuicidal. And that basically just means that it's when someone um, mimics the act of suicide, but they don't have the intent to die and they don't end up killing themselves. So what we are talking about is self-injury is a parasuicidal um, behavior. It is not a suicide attempt. So go ahead and add that to your definition of self-injury. Uh, the intention is not to kill oneself. Um, what we think about self-injury as, as a means of coping. So it is, um, it is a way in which uh, it's a solution to problematic experiences, which we'll talk more about. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that those who do self-injure are over nine times more likely to report a suicide attempt. So, um, you know, if someone is engaging in self-injury, they might also are very likely to see um, self or see suicide as another um, as another option. So, just because someone is self-harming doesn't mean they're trying to commit suicide, but that there is a, a link to that. That they're more likely to attempt suicide. So that is that one's false. Okay, number two. Man. And we also want to speak to you guys. We um, we actually are not able to see this. I'm hearing that you guys are able to see the polls. For some reason, that's not showing up on our screen. So we're kind of working through some technical difficulties and still want to be sharing this information with you. Um, so it may be a little bit one-sided with the conversation. Um, the next thing that the next true or false we wanted to ask um, is true or false, self-injury means cutting on oneself. Give me just a second to answer that. Okay, so wanting to answer that. So I guess this one was a little bit of a trick question for you guys um, because you are all correct. Uh, it is absolutely does mean cutting on oneself and it is not limited to that specific form of harming oneself. Um, it's, it's often a common way of engaging in self-injury, but there's many different ways where clients that we work with engage in this. So a few different ways um, could be engaging in burning on oneself, um, bruising oneself, head, head banging, biting, embedding objects into the skin. Um, in extreme cases of break, you know, where someone's engaged in breaking their own bones. Um, trichotillomania is a form of self-injury in which someone pulls out their hair. Um, also, we would include in this eating disorder behavior. So that would include over-exercise, restricting food, purging, and binging. binging excuse me. Um, those are, have very serious side effects to the body. So we um, would also include that as a, a form of self-injury. So the next one, number three, I believe. Um, Megan, I think that's you. Oh, yes. Uh, people who self-injure have a history of trauma and or abuse or have a borderline personality disorder diagnosis. So true or false, people who self-injure have been traumatized or abused or have borderline personality disorder diagnosis. We'll give you just a second to give us your answers on that one. All right, so 60% of you said that that's true. And 40% said false. So, Megan, we shed some light on that. Absolutely. So, it is not limited to this. This is common symptoms we've seen, but definitely not the case for, um, for people who self-injure. A recent study found that almost half of college students with current self-injury behavior show no identifiable, identifiable mental illness to fit anything within the DSM-5. Um, and speaking to that about, you know, where some confusion comes in, those who have borderline personality disorders, about 70% of them do engage in self-injury. However, those who engage in self-injury often do not meet the diagnosis for borderline personality disorder. We would say people who engage in self-injury struggle with um, kind of looking at the biosocial model around that, that they have some emotional dysregulation and use it as a means to manage emotions. Um, do not um, have to have a trauma background, abuse, any sort of abuse background, or meet the borderline personality disorder diagnosis. All right, on to the next one. Number four, self-injury is addictive. So you'll see that one pop up on your screen, true or false, self-injury is addictive. 
give you just a second to answer that. So 90% said true, 10% said false. You guys are exactly right. Um, so self-injury does show addictive qualities. Um, people who self-injure liken it to using other to using substances, and they talk about needing increasingly more or deeper injuries to feel the same effect, which would be tolerance. Um, they also report an experience of withdrawals. Um, they pursue this behavior for the purpose of mood modification. And, you know, life becomes unmanageable. There's conflict between their loved ones and them over this behavior. And there's also evidence of relapse despite best intentions. So we're going to talk a lot more about what, um, how that addictive process works. But you guys are exactly right. Um, Self-injury is addictive. We also kind of might have given it a little bit away with the theme <laughs> of our <laughs> webinar today. Exactly. So we want you to, uh, to get all these right. Right. <laughs> All right, the next one, um, hint, this one's a, a good one too. Okay, self-injury is contagious. So true or false, self-injury is contagious. Give me just a minute to answer here. All right. We're just waiting to get the information back. Here we go. We got 40% true, 60% false. So we actually speak to um, this is true. Self-injury is not contagious like a flu, you know, or like a common cold. However, it is rapidly seen to spread in, in the communities and populations when there is a, when people are engaging in self-injury. So. Um, Research just is providing more and more information how it's become contagious over sites of social media, Facebook, Twitter. There's um, all sorts of a cultural contagion to it. Um, I know for individuals I work with, it's kind of become part of even community within that, an identity within like young teens. I had um, a teenager I was working with and what they, her and her friends would engage in like a certain type of self-injury together and that was part of it and it's, it kind of was met from just one, one individual kind of bringing it into the group and others kind of learning this way of managing their emotions. So we would say that that is actually true. All right, number six, our last one is people self-injure for attention. True or false, people self-injure for attention. <clears throat> I'll give you just a second to answer that. All right, results are in 30% true, 70% false. So um, it's, it is false, that's, that's it. Um, so what we think about here is that if it's not a cry for attention, then why do people do this? Uh, we're going to use a term called experiential avoidance. That's actually an acceptance and commitment therapy term. I think it's incredibly useful to describe not only self-injury, but really any addiction. It's um, thinking about um, my own personal private experience. So what that means is that, you know, Megan's sitting here with me and she's not doesn't necessarily know what's going on inside of me right now. She can't hear my thoughts. Um, she can't see the, the sensations or feel them that are in my body, the feelings that I'm having. So that's my private experience. And a lot of times that is uncomfortable and unbearable for people. And so they're wishing, working to avoid that experience, that private experience. And so the way that they manage it is through, um, through self-injury. So they're attempting to control, avoid, change that private experience through this behavior, and the behavior ends up controlling their lives, and that's how it turns into um, an addiction. So self-injury is not the problem, it's the solution to the problem. The problem is that then it becomes the problem, mm -hmm. right? That's why people come to TK is because of self-injury um, or other examples. So absolutely, and I think here I always like to speak on um, kind of taking a less pejorative way of looking at attention and that often clients we work with 
um, engage in this behavior and it is met with attention or even just like a way for them that they've learned to feel loved, cared for, you know, seen in some way. So we're just even saying like this is the best way that, you know, the best way they've learned how to get support. So really wanting to kind of change the way we examine that to be more of from an understanding function, uh, the function of the behavior over kind of seeing it as attention seeking. Yeah, so working to really validate where they're coming from and say like, you're doing the best you can um, and you there's a reason for this. And we'll talk a lot more about validation as we continue. Um, and do you want you to, we're going to kind of shift into talking about process addictions. Um, so keep this in mind, the function of self-injury, this, this experiential avoidance piece. Um, working to manage or reduce these um, painful private experiences, get a sense of relief from them, um, feel a sense of control, be distracted from painful emotions. If you're feeling numb, then to generate a way to feel something or anything, um, or to communicate to other people that you need help. So thinking about how this applies to self-injury also applies to so many of the other um, experiences of our clients and other addictions as well. Let's shift into talking about what a process addiction is. And thank you guys for, for doing, doing the true and false and sticking us through those technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, so what are process addictions? Um, a process addiction is an addiction to an activity or process that does not involve taking brain-affecting substances. So examples of this, you know, obviously it's self-harm. Um, think about, again, what you see your clients doing to, to numb or to escape the pain in their lives. Uh, internet addiction, gambling, exercise addiction, kleptomania, which is the act of stealing things, um, addiction to food, addiction to sex, addiction to love, shopping, trichotillomania, which, again, is another form of self-injury. So um, the thing to remember here is that process and substance addictions, they both stimulate a neurochemical reward in the brain. Absolutely. So if one is to look at, like, an actual scan of the brain, when someone engages in a substance, they actually stimulate the same pleasure source in, um, reward center in the brain and release dopamine within the brain the same way that someone who is engaging in opioids what to engage in their process addiction. So it actually stimu stimulates very, the brain exactly like an addiction, a substance addiction does. Right. Um, so the only difference ultimately between a substance and process addiction is that being addicted to a physical drug carries the additional harm of the direct effects of the drug itself. So alcohol is going to, could potentially injure my liver. Um, I might, you know, um, you can have a heart attack from using stimulants, whereas that is not the case with shopping. Yeah. Some other ways why it qualifies under the addiction, the the same as an addiction is that actually because it releases the same pleasure-seeking chemicals in the brain, you also can develop a tolerance and then also need to be seeking that high. So engaging more and more and more in whatever the process is. Today, obviously, speaking about self-injury, so needing to self-injure more often and um, more intensely to create the same kind of high within the body. And in the DSM, we're going to see similar um, experiences. So when we diagnose with the DSM-5, you're going to see that there's a requirement for the addiction um, diagnosis that it's affecting your work and your social life, um, your functioning. And you're going to see the same thing show up with process addictions and to our conversation today with self-harming especially. All right, so let's talk about how to treat this. We are coming from the DBT perspective, so why? Why do we think DBT is the, the way to treat self-harm? Megan? Okay, so first and foremost, there's repeated empirical evidence to support DBT as being effective to support people with emotion dysregulation who use self-injury as a way to regulate. Um, so repeated studies to support this. Next piece is that it actually is teaching our clients that we work with new skills, new ways to manage these emotions. It's teaching them about their emotions, teaching them how to experience them, teaching them how to problem solve in moments of struggle, and teaching them how to communicate what's going on so they can find a different way to get support. And the reason for all of this is because now we know that the brain is not static. We can learn new things even though, you know, we're not developing like we were when we were children. So because the brain is plastic, we can we can learn these new skills, we can create new neural pathways to be able to react, um, not react, respond to our these painful private experiences with other ways instead of these um, avoidance techniques such as self-harming. So we're going to use new skills instead of self-harming. 
and we have the capacity to learn that. So let's talk about what a DBT program looks like. So we are not going to go too into detail, but we did feel like it was important to spe like be specific into what an actual DBT program is. Um, there's a lot of things out there that are representing themselves as DBT. So these are the elements that Marshall Linehan, the creator of DBT, specified in her manual to be part of the program, um, these four main elements. So the first is individual therapy, so working with an individually trained therapist with DBT from the DBT beliefs and hierarchy. The next piece is a skills group, so where then the client is engaging in about an hour. Here we do two to three hours of DBT skills group, but where you're teaching the client um, actual skills so they can be using those in their daily life. The next one is DBT consultation, so that's what we like to call therapy for the therapists. So this is um, people who struggle with emotional dysregulation. It can be hard for a therapist to, um, you know, also stay regulated in that. So this is where we get together as DBT therapists just to support and validate one another and also hold each other accountable to be taking this non-pejorative and effective way of supporting their clients. I know I value our consultation, Megan. Yes, and having validation from peers is so helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and the last piece is skills coaching. So being able to help clients in the moment really pull those skills out of them that have kind of been stuffed into them in the skills group. So through that, um, their own practice and also support in um, outside of group setting. Great. Okay. So what is DBT? So DBT stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Um, a dialectic. What's a dialectic? So that is the synthesis of two opposing truths. So we're going to take the black and the white. And Megan, what do most people say you get when you mix black and white? Well, that together makes gray, Leela. Megan, that is so true. Everybody says that. But when we're doing the dialectic, we're holding the truth of both of them. So you see the yin-yang here on your, um, on your screen. That is a visual representation of finding the truth in the black and the truth in the white. Another image that we like to use that can help people is the image of a zebra. Have you ever seen a gray zebra? I have not. No. A zebra is both black and white. So with the dialectic, what we're working to do is hold the both and the truth in one, um, you know, the opposing experience parts of my experience. Um, so how would you kind of define the, like what's an example of a dialectic for you? Sure. So yeah, gray is taking the black and white and putting it together and making gray is compromising both to make something different, right? And we want to hold something in its full entities and validity of both. So a big dialectic that I know that well, we see within clients is I want to get better, I want to use my old behaviors. I want to do both. So um, the world kind of giving them this either orness of it, and um, or trying to find this middle. And actually, we're just going to say, of course, you want to use your old behaviors, and of course, you want to get better. And we could hold both. Yeah. Another one we often hear is, you know, I love this person, and I'm also really angry and hurt by them. And that sometimes we tend to overemphasize one or the other. So if I'm really focusing only on the love part, I might ignore the ways that they've hurt me. Or if I'm hyper-focused on the ways that they've hurt me, I might forget that I actually have true you know, care and affection for them. And so working to really live in that tension, a lot of people, um, or at least for myself, when I think of living in my own personal dialectic, it is a place of tension for me. And so um, I thought that's kind of how I know I'm being dialectical is when it hurts. <laughs> so, which is kind of problematic a lot of times because our clients are working so hard. Let's face it, we are all working so hard to avoid pain. So um, DBT is really inviting us to live in that tension and to say, like, I'm, I'm going to hang out here where it's incredibly painful, and this is where my meaningful life is. So let's talk about yes. meaningful life. And the big dialectic, one of the biggest dialectics that we're balancing within DBT is this balance of using and learning skills to find both acceptance and change. Um, we want to speak to the what DBT is, we need to talk about what the goal is. So the overall goal of DBT is to live our meaningful lives, learn skills to manage invalidating environments, problem like thinking patterns, difficult emotions, old patterns of living. So you, we can hear the dialectic in that too. Like in order to live my meaningful life, I will have all of these factors show up and I can still have my meaningful life. Often they want, you know, clients come to us and they're like, okay, I want to get rid of these emotions and this pain, and then I will be able to live my meaningful life. And we're actually teaching them that it's in the inclusion of these struggles to be skillful so they can have their meaningful life. So many things that are meaningful just inherently involve pain. 
being a parent, being in um, a partner relationship, being having parents is painful, right? And so working to say that to be a part of these important relationships, to do the work that we love, to be engaged in the hobbies that we love, all of those things to some degree involve um, some level of pain. And so using skills to um, to be present to that experience, because um, we've been working really hard to escape that for a really long time. But when we really draw this out for our residents, what they start to see is that, you know, I've been working to not feel the pain, and what ends up getting sacrificed is my meaningful life. And so we're working to say, how can you have pain and also meaning at the same time? Um, yeah. So let's shift into talking about the particular skills and the particular dialectic of the skills. So DBT is split into four different skills modalities within the skills group. So we have our acceptance skills, which is mindfulness and distress tolerance, which we're going to focus on um, more so than our change skills today. We would love to talk about all of them, um, and we get shorter time with you. So uh, mindfulness, distress tolerance, and then inter emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness. But let's jump right into talking about mindfulness. So mindfulness is, um, it's an acceptance skill, and what we are doing in mindfulness is practicing awareness. We are working to become aware of the things that we work so hard to shut out. Um, aware of our thoughts, aware of our emotions, aware of our physical sensations. So you'll see a couple quotes that we thought really captured that. Thoughts are what we have. Thinking is what we do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so just because a thought shows up doesn't mean you have to pay attention to it. So what we're going to work to do in mindfulness is begin to become aware of our thoughts. And then once we're aware of them, then we can make changes. I don't have to listen to my thought telling me to engage in self-harm right now. I can actually choose to use a skill instead. I can't make that choice if I'm not aware of the urge to engage in the behavior. I always find it helpful when I speak about mindfulness to talk about what it's not, so kind of some of the misconceptions around it. And it's really important to be stressing that mindfulness is not a relaxation technique. Mindfulness is not a, it's something to be entertaining. Mindfulness is not about clearing the mind. That's mindlessness, right? We're talking about mindfulness. So as Leila said, it, mindfulness is about the noticing and seeing the choice that we get to decide what we're present to. Um, while including other other aspects of the experience. So we're never trying to control thoughts or emotions. We're not trying to make them stop showing up. We don't have that power. Um, what we're really working to do is accept just those really painful thoughts and emotions that come to us, um, accepting them as there, acknowledging them that they're there, and then getting to make that choice. So we're actually going to do a mindfulness practice. Right. And before we hop into it, I think just oh, even, I ahead. that's okay. I just want to speak to um, kind of mindfulness practice. We is the actual exercise that we're going to engage in together. And the separate piece of what we're doing with the clients and what we do in our lives is the actual application of mindfulness. So it's kind of twofold where we do these exercises to strengthen our ability to see choice and focus on um, what we choose to make our intention about over letting our mind decide for us, and then the, the exercise versus then choosing to do that in present moments of struggle or even just times we need to be paying attention. Exactly. So just as if I'm, you know, playing soccer, there's the cones in the middle of, of the field and I have to do drills around them. There's the function of that is to teach me how to move my legs and, and move the ball effectively. When I play a game of soccer, there's not cones in my way. There's well, actually people, right? And so, which is a lot like real life, right? So we're doing these exercises to teach to teach us how to notice, how to pay attention so that when I'm having the urge to self-harm, when real life kicks in, I have the ability to pay attention, as Maggie said. All right, so practice. Okay, so we're going to do a very brief mindfulness practice. Um, normally, we would start off with a five-minute practice with our clients. We're gonna, just going to do about a minute or so because we do want to make sure we have some time for questions. So <clears throat> first off, um, what we're going to do, I'm going to invite you to get in your mindfulness position, which means both feet flat on the floor. Your back straight and not rigid. Your hands comfortable in your lap. Notice any urges to scratch or shift or fidget in any way. You can do that after this minute is up. We are going to work to commit our attention to our breath. And I'm actually going to guide us through it uh, for just a moment to kind of get us oriented. This may be the first time of practicing mindfulness for many of you. So um, what I'd like you to do, if, if you can, close your eyes. and. Um, Begin to turn your attention to your breath. 
Now, as soon as I say that, what we are going to feel inclined to do is start controlling our breath, and I want you to let go of that urge. I want you to simply notice the way your breath is right now. So notice the rhythm, notice the pace. Are you breathing deep? Are you breathing shallow? Are you breathing fast, slow? Are you breathing through your nose or your mouth? Are you stuffy, right? Do you have any congestion? Can you feel the rise and fall of your chest? Or is your breath coming more from your abdomen? Just kind of noticing the origin of your breath as well. So what we're going to do for the next minute or so is just notice. So I want you to pick one aspect of your breath, be it the sensation of the air coming in through your nose or the rise and fall of your chest. And I want you to anchor your attention on that one sensation. And what we're going to do is notice all the things that our mind wants to think about. Um, when is this going to be over? How long is this going to take? What's the point of this? Am I doing this right? Um, maybe you have a history of doing meditation and this feels familiar, but maybe a little different. Just notice all the things that your mind is going to try to give you in this moment and continuing to bring yourself back to that sensation. That sensation is our commitment. Um, we're committing to that sensation for the next minute or so. So breathe with me and Megan, focusing on that sensation. Noticing what your mind is giving you and inviting your attention back to your breath. Okay, so that was like 20 seconds, but I'm going to move us forward. Um, so then we often engage in a review with our clients about how this exercise went. So I will share how it went for me, Leela. Go ahead. So um, I noticed I was paying attention to my breath, and my mind really, really wanted to invite me to hang out to think about what we, you know, about the webinar. So it was about just choosing, acknowledging, of course, my mind's going to give me that, that awareness, and then seeing that I had choice to come back to my breath be an observer of my breath. And it was just that gentle practice of shifting it back again and again each time that invitation arose. Yeah, so our minds are going to show up every day in time, right? And they tell us the same story a lot. I noticed that for me when I do a mindfulness exercise, the things that my mind wants me to focus on are things that my mind always wants me to focus on. Um, so what shows up for me in an exercise often shows up for me in real life. Um, for me, it's doing it right. I don't know about the rest of you, if anybody else is a recovering perfectionist, but that's absolutely the story my mind has for me that I have to be perfect. And so um, just working to be like, oh, Hey, thought, and I'm just going to invite my attention back to my commitment. So always remembering that DBT is inviting us to live our lives according to our commitments and our values uh, instead of thoughts and emotions. And I felt like when, when we call it a thought, it actually really empowers that choice because I'm saying, hey, I'm thinking this over it being true. So maybe like, especially for our clients, some core beliefs really can show up of, you know, I'm worthless or I'm unlovable. And when we can really to put that space um, when it's an observable thought of I'm thinking I'm worthless and then really observing and describing that, it helps me to then see I actually have choice in that. I'm thinking I'm worthless. And then there's a me that has choice while I have this thought over seeing it as my, ch as my core belief. Absolutely. All right, so mindfulness is the core of everything we do in DBT. If you're not doing mindfulness, you're not doing DBT. Um, so we are going to take this mindfulness into the stress tolerance, which has some um, really tangible skills for us to grab onto. So Megan, you want to explain distress tolerance for us? Yes. So mindful, uh, distress tolerance is definitely the application of mindfulness in distressing situations. Um, I really love talking about distress tolerance and really appreciate um, Marshall Linehan naming this section distress tolerance skills. Um, it's very much what we've learned up to this point to be called coping skills, um, with just, in my humble opinion, a, a more uh, validating name. Uh, we're talking to our clients about what can you do to get through this moment, this agenda of tolerating over the, there may be old agenda of feeling better, right? Um, this is about seeing I can have a painful emotion and what do I add to my current moment to help me manage and get through it over how to feel better. 
because the truth is, you know, for our clients who engage in self-injury, when they're having an intense urge to self-injure, of course what would feel better would be to act on that urge. And we're helping them say, okay, absolutely, of course that solution's showing up, and what can you do to get through the moment? Um, so the agenda is about being better over necessarily, not necessarily feeling better. Because the emotion and the urge is not actually the problem, it's the choice that we make to engage in the behavior that is the problem. So helping them not really see that. Which really sucks, right? <laughs> it, it sucks to not feel better. And that is what, again, what we're inviting people into is to this like meaningful approach to life. I'm going to feel pain, this is going to suck, and I'm, I'm choosing that uh, because that's where my meaning is. And a lot of the work that we do is kind of connecting that meaning for clients and saying like, yeah, I know it would feel better to self-harm right now, I absolutely hear you, and choosing that meaning over that, that solution. So. What are some specific distress tolerance skills that um, we found helpful? So I wanted to share just a couple tangible ones to walk away with. And um, a, a one that commonly shows, there's no perfect skill for any situation, but TIP has been really seen to be effective with a lot of the clients that we work with to use the TIP skill to manage self-injury self urges. So TIP is an acronym standing for temperature, intense exercise, progressive muscle relaxation, and pace breathing. Um, and this is actually speaking to um, treating the physiological symptoms of an experience. So Lila mentioned earlier about private experiences. Our emotions are physical sensations in our body and thoughts showing up. So the actual, we can use a type of temperature to treat, you know, how like physically feeling like hot and when, when someone's feeling panicky. Can you hold ice? Can you splash cold water on your face? Um, Intense exercise. Can you get some movement to actually change your heart rate to get the muscle, the muscle change, tension in your body change to change endorphin levels in your mind? Um, progressive muscle relaxation. So doing different exercise to tense and release different muscle groups of the body to help um, change the physiological aspect of the muscles. I have heard again and again this be useful just because it kind of mimics the, that build up and tension release the sensation that clients can get from self-injury. Um, again, no perfect skill works for every single person, but I've heard that this is one that I've seen be helpful. Um, last part of the acronym is PACE breathing. So we can actually change our own heart rate by changing the way in which we're breathing. So really helping the clients to breathe out longer than for how they're breathing in. So we kind of help do counting with breath or shapes or however we want to do that. All right, next up is pros and cons. So the way this one works is, I mean, people are pretty familiar with, you know, a basic pros and cons chart. We just kind of expanded a little bit when we use DBT. So on the left part of your screen, you'll see the pros and cons of self-harming. We're gonna look at this in terms of the short term and the long term. So for instance, this might, instant, this might look like the pros of self-harm in the short term are gonna be instant relief, escape um, in the long term. Um, you know, maybe we talked about how self-harming can be contagious, so there's that sense of um, connection or identity that can show up with an addiction. Um, so I've seen people really include that piece with the long-term pros. People are tempted to say that there are no long-term pros, but there are reasons why we do these behaviors. And the pros and cons chart is incredibly validating to that experience. We're also going to acknowledge that there are cons. So what are some short-term cons? Well, you might bleed everywhere. That's a short-term con, a long-term con. You might have been lying to your family and sacrificed some important relationships along the way. Um, so we'll really explore and flesh that out. In fact, I ask people to tell me what relationship in particular is at risk with this behavior. Like name, name it um, and get really specific. On the other side, on the right side, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of abstaining from self-harming, so using skills instead, because again, there are pros and cons. So the short-term pros, there may not feel like there are any, but there might be some. So a short-term pro of using skill, can you think of one, Megan? Feeling proud of yourself? Yeah. A long-term pro might be almost the opposite of the long-term con. I get to restore that relationship with my mom. Um, a short-term con might look like this is really freaking hard. <laughs> That's the one I hear Feeling a lot. Feeling pain, yes. <laughs> yes, this hurts, absolutely. A long-term con might look like I'm losing a piece of 
my identity. People really begin to identify with their um, addictions. It becomes part of who they are, and there's a grieving process in letting that go. So really validating and acknowledging that. Now, really quickly, there are two ways in which I recommend using this still. The first is filling this out when you are regulated. So even working with you as the therapist, having filling it out together, getting super specific. So just filling it out is using the skill. But then having it available when you're dysregulated and you're about to self-harm. Because there's no way you're going to be able to come up with short-term and long-term pros and cons when you're about to engage in a behavior. Um, so what we want to do is have this ready and available when that urge hits so that you can see, okay, this is what I can lose, and this is going to, if I engage in this, and validating, this is hard, I knew that this would be hard, and I'm going to feel so proud of myself when I use a skill instead. Did you add anything, Megan? I think that's perfect. Awesome. All right, we're going to move us along. Um, so our other skill sets, that's our emotion regulation. Really briefly, um, this skill is actually what we do in the day to day. It's about routines. We're not using these in our crisis. That's what distress tolerance is for. Emotion regulation skills, it's this approach of our, approaching our emotions as allies, um, changing our reaction to our emotions. We're never changing emotions. We're just reacting to them in a new way. We have some specific skills that we might do that. Um, and then we level the playing field. So if you guys have ever heard of being hangry, I know that I have personally experienced that. Um, so when you're hungry, you are more vulnerable to being angry. And so what we're doing is making choices to level that playing field. So I'm going to make sure that I'm nourished throughout my day so that when I have an experience of irritation or annoyance, it's not amplified by the fact that my physical self is so I'm going to level that playing field. I love this skill set. It's my favorite one, but I have to move on. So let's talk about interpersonal effectiveness. So the last of the four of the DBT skill sections is interpersonal effectiveness. And it, we said the goal is to live our meaningful lives, which obviously involves communicating with other people. No man is an island, right? So um, we have to kind of teach our clients to better speak to what they're feeling, their thoughts of thoughts and feelings, being able to set limits, say no, ask for support, and, and speak on what's going on. So we walk through different acronyms to help them learn more effective ways to communicate because they're doing the best they can given the tools that they were given, and we want to give them some different tools to better speak on what's showing up. All right, so our next really, this, this diary card is so essential for treating any kind of um, behavior. Self-harming is, is incredibly effective. So if you look at the upper right part of your screen right here, you're going to see the days of the week, Monday through Sunday. So we're going to find Thursday, which is today, and we're going to move horizontally across. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our clients rate on a scale of 0 to 10 the intensity of their emotion for Thursday. So for sadness, all the way across, and on a scale of 0 to 10 for every single emotion. Next, we're going to move over to the urges. On a scale of 0 to 10, I'm going to rate the intensity of my urges to engage in behaviors. For our purposes, we'll talk about self-harming. So on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the highest, my urges to um, self-harm. Now this final section, I'm going to check off which behaviors I engaged in. So if I engage in self-harm, do a little check mark there. Now there's two reasons why we have them fill out this top part. The first is we want to start to create a relationship. Um, notice the patterns between the emotions and the urges. So if my shame is usually really high, the same time that I have lots of urges to self-harm, high urges, it has really important information. It helps me notice that when I'm feeling shame, I need to clue in and work to be safe from self-harming. Or alternatively, what we might have more awareness over is the urges to self-harm. And then that can help us take a step back and say, hey, could there be some shame stuff going on right now? And really checking in with ourselves and getting um, you know, the support around that particular experience. So the first piece is really creating the patterns, helping us notice, again, this is about paying attention. So paying attention to urges and what's behind them. Because again, the, the urges are just a solution to a problem, which is usually <laughs> related to these painful emotions. Um, the next piece of this is that well, the very act of keeping track of a behavior actually helps you decrease it in the long term. So if I check off self-harm every single day this week, even if I did it every single day, that is actually going to help me decrease my self-harming in the long run. So research is giving us this evidence that just tracking behaviors is going to help us stop them. Um, so that's another piece of that. Okay, so the bottom part. So this time we're going to work vertically. So I'm going to find Thursday and go down. Um, and so what we do here is we check off all the skills that I use today. So if I use my tip skill, which is right here, um, to help me deal with my self-harming, and then I self-harmed So if I use my, um, my tip skill, I'm going to check it off right here. 
Now, if I ended up self-harming and I could have used my tip skill, instead I'm going to do an X. Now, there's two reasons for this. First is I want to give myself some credit for the skills that I'm learning. People get very overwhelmed by all these DBT skills. If you'll see, this is a list of the skills and we haven't even talked to you about all of them. It's very overwhelming. Um, and as you learn them, you get more confident. Like, oh, look at all these skills that I know. And the next piece of this is that on Friday, if I feel like self-harming, look, I have a ready-made list of skills that I could try because I didn't try them yesterday. So I have all my X's here and I have some checks for what worked and the X's for what I could have tried. So then I have a ready-made skill list in front of me. So the diary card is absolutely essential for decreasing um, self-harming. The next thing we're going to talk about, our last tool that you can implement is called the behavior chain. So behavior chain is something that you would use mostly in an individual session as kind of um, a solution analysis. When a client comes in and says that they engaged in self-harm, I, from a DBT standpoint, I know that I'm going to move into organizing around change in behavior. We're not going to process the problem. We're actually going to look at like, okay, so let's see what happened and come up with more effective actions to it. So we kind of slowly break down well, what happened, first starting with this box of, um, you know, Actually, when did you self-harm? We'll start with the time that the person self-harmed. What happened? Writing that in. So then next word, like self-harm with razor in the bathroom. What was going through your mind? I, it doesn't matter anyway, right? And then the emotion, feeling hopeless. And then I ask her, rate like on a, on a scale 1 to 10. You know, maybe they'd say 9. So then, okay, so this is where the incident starts. So I'm going to go back a one minute before the self-harming, so to really see, okay, let's really flesh out the choice right before it. What was going on at 7.29? And then our client saying, okay, you know, is sitting on the tub with a razor to my wrist. Well, what was going through your mind when that was happening? Well, the thought I want to self-harm was going through your mind. Yeah, of course. So what were you feeling? Feeling hopeless at a nine. And then just really slowly going back and retracing what led up to engaging in the behavior. This is increasing mindfulness to it. This can be very painful to do with a client for both of you, right? Because you're really sitting with someone in that pain. So it's going to invite in all of these thoughts and sensations again in a space with you where you can help regulate them and really help to help kind of flag and bring notice to what was going on so they can create new choices next time. So we're saying, yes, this is familiar, and I still have choice at 7.29 to not engage. So we go back, you spend the better part of an hour retracing the steps, and then going through and adding in skills at each part, like, you know, what could you have done here, who you could have called, like, what skill can you use here to really help problem solve with this. Um, so that was the last of the tools that we wanted to share with you. Um, we included a couple other pages, so hopefully that you can just check out of some acronyms with distress tolerance, um, ideas for uh, ways to manage through the moment with accept, self, soothe, and improve, and then our distress tolerance or our interpersonal effectiveness skills, those communication acronyms that I mentioned. I realize we have about seven minutes to take some questions, so we wanted to open up to um, to you all and to Crystal to have a chance to do that. Great. Thank you so much, ladies, um, for the wonderful presentation. And now we will begin answering questions submitted. Um, and just as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the question pane in your attendee control panel. So, ladies, um, one of the first questions we received was if you can discuss tattoos and piercings as a form of self-injury. Yeah, so um, speaking of that, like where that um, – often is not, it, that that's not the intention. However, I have worked with clients who have gone to, who have pierced themselves or even tattoo themselves or go to get a piercing or a tattoo and use that as a form of self-injury, but we exclude it from the, exclude it from, um, from the definition because it's like cultural or its function is not to engage in physical pain. So it's kind of a both and answer to that. Yeah, so like culturally to get a tattoo is not about pain, but for the individual, if it's about I want to, you know, engage in a painful activity, um, if that's, if, it, if the intention is to harm yourself um, through this, it might look cool at the end, but still it's about the intention. Um, so if society doesn't think, I mean, I'm granted some society doesn't really like the tattoos, but if in general it's not about like, an, you know, 
if it's culturally sanctioned, if it's appropriate within your cultural context, it's more about the individual intention. So, so we would just ask her, what was the function of you getting a tattoo if I'm working with clients struggles with self harm? And you know, kind of smiled at me and said, well, you know, kind of was like a, a soft way of engaging in it. We would still treat it as engaging in behavior. Or if they're like, I was really proud of myself for going this long, and like, so it's really the calling to the intention. Right, so just to self-disclose a little bit, I have a tattoo, and it really hurt when I got it, and my intention to get it was to um, have this artistic piece on um, on my body, and that it was a, a very personal moment for me. It wasn't about, I want to hurt myself right now, so that's how it would be a little different. Great, thank you so much. Um, so another question from one of our attendees, can you please speak to how DBT skills groups can be structured? So groups look like we start off every group with a mindfulness exercise. So everything in DBT will start with a mindfulness exercise. Um, it is, in fact, if somebody's telling me, hey, this skill isn't working, da 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 I'm like, hey, how's your mindfulness practice? So we're encouraging our residents or our clients to engage in mindfulness on their own and then also in individual sessions. And then a skill session is also going to start with a five-minute mindfulness exercise. We would review the exercise with everyone in um, who's present, and then um, you know, typically we would uh, review homework from the week before. Uh, we might do a behavior chain if somebody is late or if somebody didn't do their homework. Um, sometimes that can take a whole session, which is frustrating for everyone and also hopefully a reinforcer to do your homework. Um, but really the time that we want to spend is over the specific skills. So Marsha Linehan has um, crafted a, a manual that we love, and um, so we would go through the four skill modules over, I think it's about a year. Um, about a year. And yeah, so we typically start with the mindfulness didactic. We, we feel like it's helpful then move into distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness. So kind of keeping an open group, having people join throughout the year, and then just having that individual stay till they go through all the skill sets. Yes. At, at TK, that's going to look a little different because our, you know, length of stay is, is much, much shorter. So we have to kind of, you know, modify it to our particular setting. Thank you, ladies. Um, another question from one of our participants um, is, first, Sarah, saying thank you for a great overview of DBT. Do you offer counselor training at TK in DBT for self-injury or process addictions? We do provide trainings. It's not very like it's not like a specific agenda to it, but yes, TK um, does offer some trainings within a DBT. How could they find more out more about that? So that would be contacting Melanie Eilers, and you can find that information on Timberline Noble's website. Great, thank you, ladies. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, one of our attendees is wondering: Do you treat self harm differently depending on the severity, such as deeper cuts versus less deep, et cetera? I don't think so. I, I personally don't. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, you know, first need to address it if it is a medical issue, like making sure that that's being treated. Um, and like, the intention is still off, is to, you know, avoid feeling those private experiences. So um, actually getting caught up in some of like, the details of the how or even like where someone is self injured. We have people self injured all over their bodies. And I think sometimes reacting to like it more intensely because of that can almost maybe uh, be less uh, supportive and just really looking at it as the function to it. Uh, obviously, if someone needs stitches, we would treat it first from a medical perspective and getting someone that medical care, but still kind of supporting with the behavioral chain and, and teaching new skills that they can use. Also being mindful of infection, um, especially in a medical facility, which is technically where we're at, we have to be very mindful of that. But, you know, with your clients as well, um, if you're in an outpatient setting, you've got to be very mindful of, of infection. And if someone's um, wound is, is not looking good, they need to seek medical attention. Thank you for answering that. Um, Another question, if the self-harm behavior is over-exercise, do you not recommend intense exercise in the TIP skill? What is a good Absolutely. alternative? We, yeah, skip that one. <laughs> no, that, yeah, skip that skill, not that question. Um, yes, because we also treat eating disorders here. So usually our, our residents who do struggle with over-exercising, you know, their hand goes up right in group. It's like, I like to discuss tip 
as as a way to manage an urge. Um, it, it's just, and we'll just point out the function of engaging in it. I often kind of change it to just movement, like how you make some movement in your body. So it's from client to client. With all of the stress tolerance we speak to, we're all completely different human beings. So something that might be more effective for Leela might be cause more anxiety in me. So really helping them see what's more effective in moving you closer to your reading for life. So one time I was um, on lodge with a group of women who they are on restriction in that they can't even walk to the dining hall um, because they're at such a, a risky state with their eating disorders. And um, when we were working to shift that physiological experience, we did a thing called power poses, which there's actually a TED talk on that was super interesting. Um, and really all that it suggests is that by switching my posture, I can actually invite in a sense of confidence. And so we just stood up and stood like Superman, you know, your arms at your side and your chest out and um, so that in that way that was kind of how we applied the skill of I'm going to shift my physiological experience and I'm not going to you know go do a hundred burpees right now. So. Thanks ladies. Um, another question, what other disorders does self-harm tend to go with? What is the profile of a person who self-harms? Um, so some risk factors that you might look for are, um, you know, it is common among teenagers. Adults do engage in this also, though, so um, don't think that just because it's a teenager that your client is definitely self-harming, and don't assume that um, your adult client is definitely not self-harming. Um, but it is common among teenagers. It is common among women. Again, that doesn't exclude men. Um, men self-harm. They're actually more likely to engage in, like, hitting. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Hitting, punching, yes. Yeah, when they're self-harming. Um, in addition, you might look for um, someone who, I'm trying to think, are there additional risk factors? Well, I think like people who struggle with, you know, like over control or feeling out of control use this as a means of managing and coping. Um, we do see a lot of um, kind of struggle, people who struggle with eating disorders when they're working on recovery, moving to wanting control in their emotions and kind of having this co-occurring disorder and using some self-injury. So we see a, see that frequently. A little bit of whack-a-mole, as we like to call it. Like right. you have one addiction kind of under control and then you will start engaging in something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that answers somewhat to your question. There's really, there are risk factors and I mean, there are a number of ways to avoid pain. <laughs> Thank you, Leela. Um, I think we have time for maybe just one more question from an attendee is asking, can you share how you work with shame and self-injury? Yeah, so um, I, I get that question a lot when I talk about doing a um, doing the behavior chain because it often does kind of elicit this experience of shame. And in the same moment, like getting to speak to that and almost moving it from this like core beliefs of I am bad to like I did something that's not honoring who I want to be anymore. So we're kind of taking the secret out of the self-harm by making it speakable, talking on it, even using the diary card, you're kind of taking making this less secret shameful thing and making it something like, yes, I engaged in it. So I'm not holding a secret. I'm not making it shameful. I'm validating that it makes perfect sense that you want to engage in this given the way that it helps you manage uncomfortable emotions. So one, validating it because I feel like that more than some other addictions it has kind of this taboo and shame around it. And people like, there's no purpose. Even the pros and cons helps to lift that shame that like, of course, that this makes sense and that you're engaging it. All these tools kind of can help um, change and shift that shame experience. I would simply add, you know, I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown and her work on <laughs> Megan Smiling. Yeah. It's, yeah, I'm a huge fan. Um, I think a lot of what Brene talks about is just different language for what we actually do in DBT. Um, and so kind of creating some resilience to that shame, but also working to really validate it. Um, as Megan said, through these particular interventions, and also with us, within us as the therapist, it can be scary to have a client who is showing you these wounds and telling you, you know, I just want to cut myself. Like, it's it's scary as a therapist to engage, to, you know, to see someone hurting like that, um, and then hurting themselves. And so really, and then our personal you know, judgments on that, whatever shows up for you when you think about self-harm. Um, and so really working to approach 
um, that behavior, like looking intent, very intently at the function of it and really, um, like Megan said, validating it. I would also say building resilience to that shame is part of that is making it speakable and talking about it um, early and often too. And also, um, oh, I was thinking of another Brene piece. <sighs> I just use her name like, no, oh, it's a Brene thing. Uh, but really uh, reflecting on like, oh, this is what I was going to say, is that a lot of people don't want us to feel shame. We're like, oh, don't be shamed. Don't feel shameful. Um, and I will never tell you to stop feeling an emotion that is contrary to everything we teach in DBT. Feel that emotion. Um, shame is there for a reason. What message is it trying to send you? Does that mean you have to listen to the message? Absolutely not. Um, but I always want to come from a place of like, given where you're at in this moment, it makes a lot of sense that you feel this way. And how can I be with you in that? Even though I might feel dysregulated by your shame and your experience of self-harming, I'm gonna stay present to you. So, you know, that's why we talk a lot about in DBT, the consultation to the therapist, because it's hard. It's hard to be present to another person's pain. And so we really encourage you, don't endeavor <laughs> to do DBT um, without the support and consultation of other therapists, because um, you're working to stay regulated in a very dysregulating conversation um, and working to say, you know, your shame is valid and you can have that here. I'm not going to tell you you can't because that's the message that our clients have heard all their lives is don't feel the way you're feeling. And we're not going to, we're not going to recreate that message um, in our relationship. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Megan and Leela, for um, an excellent presentation this evening. And thank you again to all our attendees um, who are with us tonight. And just to let you know that your program evaluation form has been uploaded, and it's in the handout pane of your control panel. So you should be able to click on that, open it, and download that form. And if you could please fill out the program evaluation form, and there are directions at the bottom um, in regards to who to email that for, or to, I'm sorry. And that concludes our webinar for this evening. So thank you again to everyone who attended. If you do have any further questions or are having any difficulties downloading the form, please feel free to contact me at crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, at edhnetwork.com, and I will be more than happy to assist you. Also, when you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you can complete that and provide your feedback. You should also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 40 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Addiction Hope, Timberline Knowles, and our presenters, thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy your evening.